Welcome to this edition of American Purpose. My name is Jack Moline, and I am president of Interfaith Alliance. 60 years ago, Henry Luce, publisher of Time Magazine, invited 10 prominent men, each to compose an essay on the national purpose. Then, as now, there was a sense that we stood at the beginning of a time of cultural and political change. Our project expands on that, on that work, as each episode explores one perspective on where our nation was, where it is, and where it should be going with a contemporary thought leader. My guests are from the worlds of faith, government, politics, and culture, and they have generously agreed to share this time with us. You can find out more about Interfaith Alliance and our mission to protect your faith and freedom at interfaithalliance.org and by listening to our radio program and podcast, State of Belief, at stateofbelief.com. But right now, let's find out more about the American Purpose with my guest, Wajahat Ali. Waj, welcome to the American Purpose. Hey, Rabbi Jack, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So I never know exactly how to introduce you. You're a playwright, you're a, an attorney, or as your website says, a recovering attorney. Um, you're a political commentator. What's the title we should be using for you? I, th I think Exhausted Father of Three. Uh, I, I wrote and produced and published a play when I was a young man. Uh, I was a, an attorney. I'm still licensed, but I haven't practiced in like a decade. Uh, now I'm just a guy, just a guy meandering through this, this interesting times that we're living in and trying my best to, I hope, uh, to push it forward in a, in a positive way. I hope. Well, let's find out, shall we? Yes. Yeah. Let, this is the test. That's a very rabbinical answer to the uh, and re retort. So um, my family uh, migrated to this country from uh, Eastern Europe mm. two generations ago. Uh, I am sure motivated by a desire to uh, escape oppression and live into what they had learned America was supposed to represent. Your folks came just a generation ago. Um, what was what was the nature of America that you think brought them? To this country yeah i recently asked my father you know he uh, came here as a result of the 1965 immigration and nationality act that was passed as a result of the civil rights movement in the 1960s and one that came with fraught conversation about what it means to be an american and you know uh who should be allowed to come in right but it, it was a watershed moment where basically the very restrictive immigration quotas that were put in place in the 1920s that were put in place namely to disallow your people uh, to come from america because they were the uh, to come to america they were the original invaders right eastern europeans jews italians irish catholic those quotas were lifted so the national you can't you couldn't discriminate against national origin right so my father was 18 years old in karachi pakistan had just graduated high school and him and his older brother sultan uncle were like oh my god Look, as students, we can finally go to America. And 1965 Immigration Nationality Act passed. In 1966, they were here. Two young Pakistani Americans, right, uh, going to start college and chase the American dream. And for them, my father said, America represented purpose. It, it represented progress. It represented success. It represented uh, in a place of opportunity where two young go-getters from Pakistan could really reach their maximum potential. They could come here, have access to the best education, actually have the ability to rise up, save money, uh, you know, make money, make their careers, and maybe either go back to Pakistan and help their country, or what eventually happened is they bring their family here to uh, America to achieve the American dream. And the interesting thing is my father, when he came here, he said this, I came here in 66 and it was madness here. If he goes, he goes Wajad, there were riots, uh, you know, people were rebelling against the civil rights movement. Uh, there was white lash and white rage and they moved to Nixon. He, and it was the Vietnam War. And I came here, I'm like, what the hell is happening in this country? I just want to get an education. And the interesting thing is he said this to me in the summer of 2020. He said, you know, I see what's happening with Donald Trump. And I've been in this country for more than 50 years. And this is the first time where I'm afraid for my grandchildren in this country. And he's been researching other countries where maybe we can move to. Top of his list is New Zealand. Uh, he says Vancouver looks good, but it's expensive. Uh, he says Portugal already had his dictatorship movement, right? 
In the summer, though, there was a little bit of glimmer of hope for him because he said, I'm seeing all the people protest. I'm seeing all the people in the streets. It reminds me of 66 in a way, but there's something really different. And I said, what's different? And he goes, this time they're with us. This time they're with us. I'm like, who's they? He goes, the white majority. This time they're with us. They're actually in the streets with us. And I think the fact that he said us, and, and the reason I'm spending a little bit of time on this is when he first came around in 66, he didn't consider himself American. He didn't consider himself us. He said, oh, those Americans. And when I was growing up in the 80s, I'm like, you're American too. But he, the, the, my, mo my mom and him who were both immigrants. They kind of didn't see themselves as part of the national project. They still kind of saw themselves as outsiders. But as the time went on, they kind of said, oh, there's no going back. This is home. And when he said that they are with us in the summer, I thought it was a very profound, a profound moment where he saw himself as not only us, but he said that they, the Americans who were against the, what he saw was the American project for him and his brother are actually with us. You asked me a simple question. I gave you a very long answer. No, that's great. They, you know, it's, it's, it's a short question with an answer that takes a lifetime to formulate. So that's right. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, let me let me sort of get to the subject at hand by by asking you from your perspective, uh, what was the original national purpose of the United States? It's a very that's a very easy question that can be answered in a tweet with some emojis. <laughs> you know, it depends on what I think the actual national purpose was versus the the narrative, the myth, and the story. So the story that we are taught as children is that the wise men, the founding fathers, the founding brothers decided that we must build a nation where anyone and everyone has a chance at the quote unquote American dream. And the American dream is where it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter about your national origin, your religion, your ethnicity, your race. If you work hard and you have gumption, by God, you can come to this land and you can make something of yourself. You could pull yourself up from the bootstraps and this country will give you all the resources and freedoms and opportunities to make it. That's the American dream. The purpose, and that's the purpose of this country. Uh, it, it, it is a it means it is a, a haven, a, a vehicle, uh, a, an opportunistic land where anyone can come and whatever dream you have, provided, of course, you follow the laws and you're, you're a good steward of the land, you too can achieve quote unquote success. What I think, based on history and facts, the original purpose was if you look at the founding fathers, uh, they were all men, they were all white men. More than half were slave-owning white men. Most of them were aristocrats and, and educated. And yes, they wanted to, uh, no taxation without representation, and they wanted to overthrow the British monarchy, and they wanted uh, self-determination. But they wanted that for very few people, namely people who look like themselves, them and their homies. And so the American purpose originally for the Founding Fathers was to create a free nation where anyone could achieve the American dream, provided that they too were white men of a certain class. And you see this in the documents, and you see this in the quotes, and you see this in, in, in the written letters, right? And as we know of uh, the aristocrat Elbridge Jerry, whose uh, last name provides uh, the, the namesake for gerrymandering, uh, a famous quote, too much democracy for the people is a bad thing. And, 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 and you saw limits on this, right? And even Madison, in, in his brilliance and his hubris, thought the system that he had created, the, the Declaration of Independence, right, uh, and the Constitution, uh, it, 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 would, it would be a means where uh, people's uh, goodwill will take over. And, and, it would, and, you know, if there was ever a conflict, uh, you know, the rationality w would win. But then you'd go to the election of 1800 uh, and you realize, oh, wait, it wasn't perfect. He sees flaws and he didn't take into account the fact that humankind's nature, or rather, I should say mankind's nature, uh, is greedy and allows for political parties, for partisanship, for, uh, you know, backhandedness. And look fo fast forward to 2020, and we're witnessing what happened with the system, specifically the Electoral College and the state legislatures, where we're this close, Rabbi Jack, we're this close, people don't realize, to uh, a coup. We're this close to 126 Republicans and 17 attorneys general and an entire right-wing ecosystem taking a sledgehammer to democracy because the purpose for them is not democracy. The purpose for them is power for the sake of power and power only for their tribe, namely a white male Christian tribe. And so that, I think, is the tension of America, right? For the rest of us who are they, 
you, your parents, uh, your, your grandparents, my parents, they came here to achieve and fulfill that purpose of America that is the American dream. And the reality that we have always fought against to this day is that that American dream does not include people like us, in fact, actively rejects us. And so that tension is the tension that we're fighting right now. It's the tension of fighting against white supremacy, against patriarchy, against income inequality, against corrupt power. And until we rid or cleanse ourselves of that original nefarious intent and purpose of what is otherwise a grand American experiment, I think we will be witnessing these challenges. So that that sort of leads directly into uh, the question that comes after your sense of the original intent mm. for the American purpose, which is, what should our purpose be going forward now? Clearly, there's there's enough that is admirable about about at least the mythology of what the American purpose was, um, and clearly we've fallen short of what we have idealized about that. What should be our purpose from this point? moving into the future? So it's a very good question. I, th I believe the purpose should be how can we create, sustain, uh, and share the generous American dream in a way that is achievable for everyone, right? And if you really are uh, committed to that, then that means you have to support policies and individuals who have a generous spirit, one where the tent of the American dream keeps expanding with the realization that the more of our fellow countrymen and countrywomen, regardless of their ethnicity or their immigration status or their religion, if they have a shot at success, at freedom, at self-respect, at self-determination, the rising tide lifts all of our boats. All of us. And so I'll give you an analogy. Everyone talks about that moving feast, right? So like, suppose, you know, your, your ancestors worked hard and earned their seat at the American table where they weren't on the menu, but they were eating and cooking. And they brought their latkes next to the meatloaf and next to the hamburgers, right? And then my parents finally made it and brought their uh, biryani next to the table. Right now, I feel like with 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 type type of the myopic selfishness, uh, and and as a result of some of this this narrow mindedness of what America is and should be, that's the American dream. I made it, f all y'all. I got mine, and as long as I can hold on to mine, that's it. Uh, and we're seeing that selfishness, that that utter selfishness, and that fear and that loathing, animate so much of our country. I think the purpose can be manifested in a better way where once you make it at the table, you look or back and see who else needs help and you extend your hand and bring them to the table as well. And that also means uh, voting rights. That also means a living wage. That also means spending on people. That means affordable health care. That means really rethinking uh, this whole concept of American exceptionalism, right? It's exceptional. Why? Because the system was in place just to help a few. Well, if you really want to make America exceptional, you have to help the many. And everybody has a role to play in either proactively helping or proactively challenging structures and policies and ideologies that are keeping the rest of us down. It's, it's really a a very uh, devoted attachment to the original motto of the United, United States, e pluribus unum. That's right. That, that expanding the definition of that pluribus is, is really what you're talking about here. Yeah, and also the Emma Lazarus poem, right? Like, if, if, if you want to create uh, this America where the, the, po the, the words of a Jewish poet a daughter of, uh, I believe she was a daughter of uh, immigrants. Uh, the, yep. You know, she wrote the new Lazarus. If you want the new Lazarus, that's how you create the new Lazarus, um, right? I mean, that's literally the words inscribed, you know, give us your poor, give us your tired. Like, if, if we want them. Why do we want them? Because we see potential in them. We, we, we see hope in them. We see a, a, a narrative in them where they can come here broken and they can be made whole again, right? And we have the Statue of Liberty, originally modeled after a Muslim 
<laughs> woman in a jean, right? Given to us by the French sculptor. I mean, think about that. They talk about multicultural with her torch welcoming everyone. That's very powerful. I mean, that's really beautiful. If you really think about it, I mean, like, despite all these negative aspects I had described about America, you still have this country where you have this poem called The New Lazarus by a Jewish poet, the daughter of refugees. The New Colossus. The New Colossus. Yeah. The New Colossus, excuse me. Uh, inscribed on the Statue of Liberty given to us by a Frenchman modeled after, uh, uh, I believe it was an, an Egyptian. Uh, that's very powerful. Um, so if we want to achieve this new Colossus, what are we doing? What's our part? Very nice. Very nice. So our society rests on certain foundational values. Every society does. Some of them are admirable and some of them not so admirable. Are there are there one or two values that you think are worth doubling down on these days? And similarly, are there one or two that are holding us back from progress as you as you see it? I would say the value of generosity, if I may, and the value of selflessness. And the, the reason I combine them together is it requires you to expand your heart, your arm, your 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 bed, your your table spread, literally, and one of them requires you to uh, give up, give up comfort, give up your appetite, uh, give up greed, uh, give up trying to be first in line, be third in line. And I say this because we are ravaged with a pandemic right now that has killed over three hundred thousand people, the most amount of deaths. Uh, have been in the United States of America, like nearly 20% of the deaths from coronavirus in our country with about 4.5% of the population. And you realize that it didn't have to be this way. If people were just a little bit more selfless and a little bit more generous, if they cared a little bit more about their neighbor six months ago, and of course there was better leadership, and of course there wasn't disinformation, of course, you know, these are very multiple, many factors, but there's something about that American exceptionalism and there's something about that quote unquote original American purpose. There's something about that selfishness and that drive and that greed that I think if we have to be honest with ourselves and do an audit that many Americans were like, nope, you're trampling on my freedoms. I'm not going to wear a mask. I don't care about y'all. I'm going to get mine. Right? Like it was very American in the way we responded to this pandemic compared to other countries. And look at the result. We're now the pity of the world. People pity us. It, it, that's something fascinating because no one used to pity us before. You know, like you, I've traveled the world. People were angry at America. People were upset at our hypocritical foreign policy. People used to take jabs at us for being fat and lazy, you know, imperialism. At the same time, people loved our education. They love our culture. They love our opportunities, love our freedom. But no one ever pitied us. They pity us now. And so I think in order to achieve this purpose, there has to be sacrifice through uh, holding back, right? Maybe if you're a man and you're on a panel and there's six other men, you could be like, you know what? Let me step down and give it to a black woman, right? You know what? I have a lot of money. I make over $600,000. I don't. I wish I did. I may, this is the, the wajahat on earth too. Bizarro wajahat. I make $600,000 a year. Maybe it's okay for me to be taxed a little bit more, maybe to pay my taxes and not put them in offshore accounts, because I know that money will go to pay for better housing and better education that will give these communities the chance to achieve the success I've had. You know, maybe I need to do more than simply say, where are the moderate Muslims and how come these blacks uh, are protesting? Maybe I, it's not enough just to say I'm against racism. Maybe I need to be actively anti-racist, Right. Maybe I need to donate more of my time. Maybe I need to learn more. Maybe I need to listen. Maybe I should be out there protesting as well. And I think if we have more generosity and, and we have more selflessness, we can achieve it. I think there's still hope to achieve it. Uh, and and it, again, it goes back to kind of reimagining this American exceptionalism and this uh, American purpose and this American dream and showing the ugly side of it, showing the warts right? Taking off the, the, the bed covers and seeing the dirty laundry. And I think if people were to, you know, really be confronted with it, and I think as they have been with coronavirus and the death of George Floyd, and, and just the Trump presidency, where he was so ugly and misogynistic and racist, I had a lot of folks come up to me and say, oh, you, all that Islamophobia you were talking about, you weren't crazy. You were onto something, right? Mm. And, and, and so there is an opportunity here. There is an opportunity here for us to get this right and do better, but there are so many challenges. You know, so many of our constitutional guarantees 
emphasize our commonality. Mm. Um, but the first freedom in the Bill of Rights is very personal. It's, it's religion. It's freedom of conscience. You come from a, a, a strong and proud Muslim background. What values that are rooted in your personal belief system do you commend to those who don't share your beliefs? Oh, okay. So that's, 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 that's very powerful. I think, so I'm Muslim and, you know, the, the, the freedom to exercise, the freedom to believe, the freedom to gather uh, as a religious community is, a, is one of the reasons why so many people actually have come to the United States of America. I mean, that's, you know, so many Muslims who actually have come here and made this country their home say that this is the country where they can best be a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. So it's not like they hate America. It's like they love America. All they want is America to live up to its original purpose and dream. That's it. Uh, it's a challenge. Just, you know, hey, if this is the land of the free, why are you surveilling me? If this is the land of the free, why are you seeing me as the enemy? If this is the land of the free, why do you have moss crawlers and community rakers and always ask me to test my loyalty? That's what happened to the Catholics and the Jews. And I think, you know, the, if you say that there's something unique to Islamic values, I don't know if there's necessarily anything unique to Islamic values because it is a shared spiritual lineage that falls in the traditions of Christianity and Judaism. And there is this value, I would say, and I already kind of repeated it, but I, I would, I would again double down on it. There, there is something that says that that th sees as the whole body, uh, right? The Muslim Ummah, the community, a and the Ummah is global, right? I even though I, I would say the Ummah has never existed because there's always been divisions and fractions, but it's it's the feeling that no matter who says they are a Muslim, they are nonetheless your brother. Who no, no matter who says they're Muslim, they're nonetheless your sister. And you want for your brother and sister what you want for yourself. And if you backbite against your Muslim brother, it's like you're eating their flesh, right? That's how bad it is. You, you honor them by not disrespecting them. You honor them by not taking advantage of their weakness. You honor them by not taking their property or their wealth in an illegal means, right? This is how you honor them. This is how you help them save face. This is how you elevate them. I say this all because there's another beautiful saying that if, if, a, if like, it's like if a Muslim hurts, it's like you hurt, right? It's like if their hand hurts, your hand hurts. And so you share and empathize in their pain. And you share and empathize in their happiness as well. And it's kind of a beautiful type of command or recommendation to see beyond yourself and your family and look at the quote-unquote community. And I say quote-unquote community because people define community in different ways, sure. right? And so you take that command, if you will, and if indeed we are part and parcel of the American project, and if indeed we are not they, but we are us, I want Muslims to then expand the tent and include, and it's not to say that they don't do it already, but just with the spiritual lens, include fellow Americans as well, regardless of their religion, their ethnicity, uh, their gender, and see them as part of the body, to see them as part of the family. So what, when they are hurt, you are hurting as well. And I say this knowing that in 2020, 35% of Muslims voted for Trump. And when you ask many of them, and as I have, I was not surprised by this at all. And a lot of Muslims said this, they're shocked by it. Not me. I talked to several. And they said, well, he'll be good for my taxes. Well, he's a strong man and he goes against them. Who's them? The blacks, the Latinos, those who came here illegally and those who just take, take, take. Because for some strange reason, these Muslims who I talk to who are South Asian and Arab think they're white because they chase <laughs> whiteness. The, uh, yeah, the original American purpose. Honestly, we could talk about that. Um, they say, you know what? He's a strong man and he's politically incorrect. He tells it like it is. For some reason, he, he, Trump fulfills in them this type of bloodlust where they've been wronged by society and he, he gets to punch back. And you see that, that anger, that greed, that selfishness, where they rationalize cruelty because it helps them. And I think it's completely contrary to the Islamic spirit. And you could be against gay marriage. That's fine. But it's hypocritical 
than to mock and ridicule LGBT communities who are trying to fight for freedom, but then say, oh, by the way, help me fight Islamophobia. It's hypocritical to say, oh, hey, blacks, help me fight anti-Muslim bigotry and come out and protest the Muslim man, but uh, I'm not going to come out for you uh, against police brutality. You should know better. And why don't you pull yourself up from the bootstraps? It's hypocritical to say, I came to this country with nothing, and thanks to luck and thanks to some help, I'm able to now sit on the top uh, in the suburbs. But you poor blacks and browns and immigrants, come on, stop asking for a handout. And so this is why I feel like just for, not only for my community, but for the rest of us, I feel like if we have a generous spirit where we see that we are part and parcel of a community where if one part of the community is harmed, we're harmed. I think that understanding of America and the American politic and the American community and the American purpose and the American dream can can greatly revitalize and uh, and revolutionize the American project for the rest of us. So much Very so much. that I think so so much so that I think right now our approach to the pandemic would have been so different. It's it's an expansion of the notion of Uma. Uh, it's exactly it. Sounding sounding very close to the Unum in that aforementioned uh, uh, motto. Yeah, that, unum to, uh, yeah, yeah, Unum to Uma. And, and you know, for some of us, what we keep saying within within our community and outside of our community is expanding that tent expanding that tent. Who gets to be covered by the hailstorm and the thunder, right? Mm -hmm. Who gets afforded that protection? And for me, I think our religion, based upon our understanding of an all-merciful, omnipotent, compassionate God, says everybody. You don't have to agree with them. You know, you don't have to do kumbayas. I'm not a, 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 a you know, wide-eyed, naive optimist. But at the same time, our, our, our religion commands us to help people. Uh, and unto them their way, unto you your way. If they don't help back, that's fine. But you do your good deed. And you can do your good deed by having the intention and the heart and the action which is generous and expands the tent. What are some of the things that our society would need to do in order to pursue those values? We need to elect the right people with a generous spirit who understand the national purpose is not just for um, a few donors, or a few uh, influencers in their uh, right wing or, or let's just say left wing circles, uh, not just for the rich, uh, that they are the servants of the American people. And they have been given a immense responsibility and duty to help the people, right? And for anyone in, in power, uh, I think, uh, if you look at the gatekeepers, whether it's in philanthropy, whether it's those who are rich, whether it's those who are, who are the top 1%, whether it's those who um, are in the media, whereas, whether it's those who um, have any sense, I think, of, 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 of privilege and power, uh, what can we do? How can we use that privilege and power and our roles, our respective roles, to push things forward where there's progress for all Americans and this country to achieve unum, to achieve a collective uh, well-being for the ummah, right? And everyone has a role to play. So now I went with the top. Let's start at the bottom. Many people, when I say this, they say, well, Jahat, I don't write for the New York Times. I, I, I'm not a rabbi or a sheikh. Um, I do not work in a corporate America. I do not have savings or a 401k. Uh, I do not get invited by, by colleges to give speeches. I am a, I'm a dad or I'm a housewife who sits at home and I'm taking time off from work because I'm raising three kids. What can I do? Right. I'm overwhelmed with climate change, income inequality, the pandemic, uh, my kids. Uh, I'm a dad who lost his job. Like, what do you want me to do? And I tell everyone that I believe like everyone has a superpower. Uh, I'm trying to create the ethnic Avengers or if you want the <laughs> Justice League. Right. Like if you see it like it's all if we're all part of this ju Justice League or ethnic Avengers, everyone has a superpower. And so you can be the America you want this country to be in your daily actions. You can literally in your house, suppose you don't even leave your house, model this type of generous spirit in your intentions and actions and behavior with your family. And people say, oh, but that's not going to make a difference. I'm like, really? Suppose you're a parent of three kids, right? Suppose there's a family of five in one house. Your actions will have a tangible impact on those four people for the rest of their lives, the values that you teach them, the when you come in and correct certain behaviors, when you come in and model certain behaviors. As a kid who now is a father, I can tell you, 
Like, you know, kids are effed up from their parents or kids are also <laughs> severely damaged, but also they're a help. They're like, ah, my parents, we every Sunday we used to go after church uh, to, you know, uh, give out food. At the synagogue, my, 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 my father took me, and I remember we used to always afterwards go to the hospital and check out, you know, the, the neighbor who was sick. After Juma, my father always used to take me, and he always used to make me put the $1, just $1 bill in the donation box because he said, you don't know where that $1 might go. I'm talking about small things. Uh, you can run for office. You can run for the local city board. You can, you can lo lo run for local city council. Everything becomes begins locally. And people kind of underestimate how much power or impact their footprint can have at the local level, right? You can be the educator of your community. You can reach out, suppose you're Jewish, reach out to the mosque and say, there have been tensions with our communities, but I realized I've never invited a Muslim to my synagogue. Like we talk about you, we've never seen you and you're my neighbor. These are small things that individuals can do to achieve this American purpose, this North Star in their individual actions. And everybody has a role to play. And I believe if every individual at the end of the day says, listen, I cannot control other people. I am not God. I do not know other people's intentions and actions. I am only responsible for my intention and my action and my time on this earth. And as a member of the society, this is what I commit myself to doing. I'm aware of these problems. I make the intention and this is my action. Do not underestimate the, the, the brilliant uh, impact your footprint will have on other people. And I think you'll see it very quickly, very quickly in your lifetime within a few days. Well, uh, this has been a tremendously rich conversation. I only have one more question for you. Sure. Are you optimistic about America's future? So that's a very good question. You know, if I said yes, I would be lying. But then I have to say yes, because my faith commands hope and I refuse to give in to cynicism and apathy, with I, which I think are cheap and lazy. And if you become cynical and apathetic, that literally means you're giving up and become a, becoming a spectator. And I choose to fight in the ring, even if it means getting my nose bloodied. So I'll say why I'm a bit skeptical first. It's because I believe I recognize the demons that have been unleashed. It's like many of us who covered the 2016 election. Many of us, not all of us, who are people of color or Jews or people who just had an experience where we realized we saw the entirety of the American dream and we saw the warts and the nightmares because they were visited upon us, right? We saw what America was for the rest of us. We saw how it felt being Muslim after 9-11 and being uh, the, the victims of the endless war on terror. If you're Jewish, you have stories of how, yeah, your, your grandfather had to change his name in order to get that cushy law job because they looked at his nose or they looked at his name and said, not you, Jew, or you were black and you have to teach your child at the age of 12 uh, what it means uh, to have the police stop you and you have to go through the drill, right? That's our America for the rest of us. So when we saw Donald Trump, we're like, this represents the demons that have always been at play in America. And if he wins, this is what will be unleashed. Because one of the original sins of America, white supremacy, it's on its death rattle, which has transformed into a death march. What I mean by that is the death rattle of white supremacy is why you're witnessing the global rise of white supremacy, right? They're playing for all the marbles. And so we warned, we warned, we warned, and we were ignored. And voila, here we are in 2020. And I think people are still ignoring how close we came, really, to authoritarianism, how close we're coming to fascism. This is how fascism rises. It doesn't happen overnight. And so you're seeing students of history, students of America, students of fascism saying, Wake up, America, and behold, look at the 2020 election. Look at literally what happened literally last week. 126 Republicans, 17 attorneys general. Literally what's happening right now as they're attacking Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell. They're attacking Mitch McConnell for not being Republican enough. For, uh, you know. And so these demons that have been unleashed are still here. We're dealing with disinformation at a mass level, disinformation in a right-wing media ecosystem that I believe has radicalized a third of America, and I do not think we're going to win over most of them in our lifetime. We're seeing white nationalism. We're seeing a political party, in my opinion, that has given up faith in democracy. And if they feel like they can't win uh, through democracy, they're going to give up democracy. 
and uh, they'll give up democracy they won't give up their conservative ideology uh and you're seeing um uh, the rise of white nationalism. And so we have to actively, as a society, confront this. It is not enough for a few people to do it. All of us have to do it. You have to be all in or all out, in my opinion. And that's why I think the next couple of years are going to be really rough. And you, by the way, have a pandemic. And in this country where no one wears masks. And I think where we're going to slag off because now everyone's like, oh, the vaccine. And as a result of us slagging off, as we've seen in Thanksgiving and as we're going to see in Christmas, people are going to die. So I, that's the skeptical part of me. The optimistic part of me says that in our faith traditions, if you read the Torah, if you read the Quran, the, the prophets are shared. The stories are similar. We suffer a lot. <laughs> right? We go through a lot. Allah tests his believers. But Allah also says, uh, in the Quran, and I'll paraphrase that I will not test you more than you can take. And verily after pain, there comes relief. That's a promise from God. Verily after suffering, there is relief. And so I believe we're witnessing a little bit of relief right now with the election of Biden. A little bit of relief right now where democracy barely won. A little bit, bit of relief right now where amazing ingenuity and hard work of scientists, Turkish Muslim scientists, thank you, we see a vaccine. And, and so I believe, I believe in order for us to have this collective relief, we need to work towards it. I believe in a just and merciful God, and I refuse to give up. And finally, there is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam that even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, you plant a seed. And that similar uh, story exists in the, uh, for Jews and Christians, right? You right. always plant the seed. And so if for many of us, if we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and one of them is Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell, our job is to plant the seed. That's our job. Our job is to be gardeners. And so we garden, uh, we clean it all up, we keep war working. Uh, and if we, meaning you and me, our generation is not alive enough to feel the shade and taste the fruit, we know that, inshallah, God willing, our children's generation will have that fruit. And that makes it all worth it. Well, the most generous thing you've done is include me in your generation. So I thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And I thank you for the time that you, uh, you spent with us today. Thanks to you, our listeners, too, for engaging in exploring the American purpose with us. It's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with Wajahat Ali, who has shared his perspective so generously, very much in keeping with the values he articulated. You can listen to this and other episodes at AmericanPurpose.org and learn more about our work at StateOfBelief.com and InterfaithAlliance.org. Interfaith Alliance has produced this program under the guidance of Ray Kirstein, I am Jack Moline, and I encourage you to live with purpose. <laughs>